there's a lot of talk about oxalates. And that's because elevated plasma oxalate negatively impacts many tissues and or organs. And that's what we'll see here. So a high oxalate diet on its own will lead to a buildup of oxalate in the intestine, which will then be absorbed into the bloodstream, thereby increasing plasma oxalate. Elevated plasma oxalate can then negatively impact tissues, including kidney function, where it induces tubular toxicity, obstruction, and a buildup of calcium inside the kidney, which is known as nephrocalcinosis. In addition, elevated plasma oxalate is associated with vascular calcification and poor cardiovascular health-related outcomes, including coronary artery disease, sudden cardiac death, and congestive heart failure. To make matters worse, elevated plasma oxalate can lead to a buildup of oxalate in tissues, including bone, but also the thyroid gland, lung, and spleen. But besides dietary intake, there are other ways that plasma oxalate levels can increase. One way is with poor kidney function, and note that kidney function declines during aging, which would limit the ability of the kidneys to remove oxalate from the blood, thereby leading to its accumulation and increasing plasma levels. In addition, the liver produces it, and there are specific gut ba bacterial species that can degrade it. So besides dietary intake, there are other mechanisms that can impact plasma levels of oxalate. For the purpose of this video, I'm only going to focus on dietary intake. I may focus on the others in an upcoming video. Now, the good news is that less oxalate is systemically absorbed when it binds to calcium, and then it's just pooped out. And we can see that mechanistically in this diagram. So dietary oxalate intake increases intestinal levels of oxalate. As I mentioned earlier, you can see the oxalate anions, OX2 minus. And then in the presence of calcium ions, which would be there because of a high dietary calcium intake, calcium binds to oxalate one to one, which then we excrete it, we poop it out, thereby limiting how much oxalate is absorbed and less oxalate absorption into the bloodstream means that there is a lower plasma oxalate concentration where it can then potentially limit accumulation and structural damage to tissues and organs. Now, with that in mind, how much dietary calcium is needed to minimize oxalate absorption? So for that, we're gonna take a look at this paper, which was a randomized controlled trial. People were fed oxalate, and they were also fed varying amounts of calcium, and then oxalate absorption was evaluated from, from the intestine into the blood. So on the y-axis, we've got oxalate absorption, so how much of the uh, initial amount was absorbed, plotted against the calcium intake in min mil milligrams per day. So we can see that at very low calcium intakes, oxalate absorption is relatively high. So for a 200 milligram calcium intake per day, there's about a 17% oxalate absorption. In other words, to put this into perspective, 300 milligrams of oxalates is considered a high oxalate containing diet. So for someone who's only eating 200 milligrams of calcium per day, 51 of those milligrams of oxalate would be absorbed, potentially increasing the plasma oxalate uh, concentration. But as the calcium uh, levels increase, as calcium intake increases, from 200 to 1200 milligrams per day, there's an almost perfectly inverse linear correlation between calcium intake with how much oxalate is then found in the blood. And you can see the correlation coefficient is negative 0.9997. A perfectly linear correlation in this case would be negative 1.0. So within that 200 to 1200 milligram range for calcium intake, it's almost perfectly linear, linearly inversely correlated with how much oxalate is absorbed. All right, so to put that into numbers, for someone who's eating 1,200 milligrams of calcium per day, there's only 2.6% oxalate absorption. So for, for that person who's eating 300 milligrams of oxalate, that means now only 8 milligrams of oxalate in com contrast with the 51 for a 200 milligram calcium intake, 200 milligrams per day. For someone taking in 1,200 milligrams of calcium per day, now only 8 milligrams of that 300 would be absorbed. And potentially impacting the plasma levels of oxalate. All right, but what about at higher, further, further increasing the calcium uh, intake? So from 1,200 to 1,800 milligrams of calcium per day, we can see that the correlation isn't as strong from 200 to 1,200, but oxalate absorption still decreases as the calcium increase, uh, dietary calcium intake increases from 1,200 to 1,800. For example, for someone eating 1,500 milligrams of calcium per day, only 2% of oxalates will be absorbed. So to put that into numbers for that 300 milligrams of oxalate, only six milligrams of it would be absorbed and then potentially impacting plasma levels.
So if the goal is to minimize oxalate absorption, we can eat a high calcium containing diet. Now that doesn't have to mean we're all eating dairy. For example, in my case, I eat a lot of collard greens, which do have a very small amount of oxalate relative to other greens like spinach. They have nine milligrams of oxalate per 100 grams uh, of collard greens, but you can see they also have 141 milligrams of calcium. So I'm eating about a pound of collard greens a day, which gives me about 600 milligrams of calcium with only about 40 milligrams of oxalate. So a net 560 for calcium relative to how much oxalate is there. But for those who want a more specific approach, uh, one way would be to measure plasma levels of oxalate to assess whether dietary intake may be too much. But also note that plasma levels of oxalate is going to be an integrated measure of kidney function, how much the liver is producing, and if you have gut bacteria that can degrade it. But there may be a more specific measure than just ma measuring plasma oxalate, and that's by looking at kidney function markers. When considering that elevated plasma levels of oxalate can impair kidney function, if we measure markers of kidney function, including creatinine, but then also as a better potential measure, cystatin C, if those data are youthful, then one's uh, oxalate intake, whatever it may be, uh, may be okay and not potentially damaging to the kidney. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more of my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. And before you go, we've got a whole bunch of discount links, including epigenetic testing, NED quantification, oral microbiome composition, at-home metabolomics, at-home blood testing with CyFox Health, which includes ApoB, but also Grimage, green tea, diet tracking with chronometer, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, Buy Me A Coffee. We've also got merch. So if you're interested in wearing the Conquer Aging or Diet Trying brand, as I've got on here, that link and all of the other links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.